Welcome to the Dare to Dream podcast, which was nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards and a Webby Award. Dare to Dream is rocked and ranked in the top best podcast in USA in all of self-improvement on Apple Podcasts and in multiple other countries. Thank you for joining us. Debbie Dashinger, your host, is a certified coach who coaches people to write a page turner book, takes their book to a guaranteed international bestseller, and teaches you the system to be interviewed on media and podcasts and get massive results. Debbie shows you how to use media exposure to locate your tribe, fill workshops, sell books, and gain followers. If you'd like to get your free set of tools and templates and to learn how to message yourself out to the world, go to debbiedashinger.com slash message. That's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash message. Question. Are you interested in knowing the effects that plants and medicines have on the mind? Debbie Dashinger's guest today is Dr. Richard Grossman, whose spiritual search started early and later took him traveling the globe, exploring spiritual teachers and healing arts, studying Asian philosophy, Tai Chi, massage, macrobiotics, juice fasting, yoga, Aikido, and herbal medicines. Through his studies, Richard earned a master's in acupuncture, a doctorate in oriental medicine, a PhD in oriental medicine, a diplomat in acupuncture a diplomat of pain management, and a diplomat in acupuncture orthopedics. Since then, Dr. Grossman has become recognized for the healing work he does in ceremonial settings, which is a unique combination of traditional Amazonian shamanism, deep energetic healing, and sound healing techniques from many of the world's cultures. To learn more, go to Heart feather.com. Welcome, Dr. Richard Grossman to Dare to Dream. It is so great to have you here. Thank you. Great to be here. Yeah, finally, finally. So I know you on this end of things, and I'm looking forward to finding out the winding journey and also to pick in your brain some of the wisdom that you have uh, to do what you do out into the world. I'm I'm in awe of it, frankly. And I want to start with you being a ceremony facilitator, or if there's another name you prefer other than ceremony facilitator, let me know that. I think I think given the times and given the corruption of various uh, titles of such things, ceremony facilitator sounds pretty good. Mm. Yeah. So you definitely are that. You have yeah. Unbelievable experience. I am curious, how much did it take you to get to be able to do what you do today? How much drinking, how much traveling, how much indigenous experience, how much healing work did it take for you, that whole amalgam, to be coming out on this side with what you do? It took a lifetime. I mean, literally... Somebody once said that you know what that you're doing is what you're supposed to be doing, putting supposed to in quotes because I'm questioning that there's actually anything such thing as supposed to, but that you know what you're supposed to be doing when you look back and see that your entire life has been preparation for doing it. Mm. And, you know, my, my story, I, I'm writing a book about my story right now, and uh, so I could talk here for a couple hours just about how I got to where I am right now. But in a, in a nutshell, I knew from childhood that there was something that I wanted to do, and I knew what it looked like, I knew what it would feel like, I knew what it would sound like, and I also knew that I had no idea what it was. I didn't grow up in any kind of healing environment or any kind of conscious spiritual environment. But there was always something in me that was pushing me in a certain direction. And I could say even from the age of four, when I went through an extremely traumatic event and I was given the opportunity to meet beings on the other side momentarily, that told me basically that this was all going to unfold. 
And they wouldn't tell me what was going to unfold, but they told me it was going to unfold. And they said, don't forget what we're telling you. <laughs> and of course, now all I remember is them telling me not to forget what they told me. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, I went through a number of different phases in my life when... I was 16, I started exploring psychedelics and uh, from a, you know, unguided, no grounding, no indigenous roots, no tradition kind of standpoint and discovered that what worked best for me was to close my eyes and go inside mm. and to explore this inner space inside of me. When I was 18, I ended up sitting on the banks of the Ganges with a great teacher exploring this inner realm more and more and connecting to divinity within myself. And at some point, I don't know exactly, well, then came Chinese medicine. And Chinese medicine was a very important part of my learning experience, uh, beginning to understand Qigong, beginning to understand Tai Chi, and how the ancient Wu shaman of China uh, developed their philosophies via using the I Ching and other tools of spiritual exploration there. And then round about two, maybe a year after I graduated from acupuncture school and got my license, a friend of mine called me up and said, I just brought back some ayahuasca from Peru. You should try this. And, uh, uh, you know, never heard of it, had no idea what it was. It sounded intriguing to me because I'd never heard of it. And so I did it. I, I took the plunge, drank the medicine, had the most extraordinary experience of my life. And I can't say it was very pleasant, but it was very profound. And during that experience, I knew without any, any figment of doubt that that was what I wanted to do with my life. I also knew without any, any doubt as well that I was nowhere near ready to do it. So after that, I spent many years as an acupuncturist, learning more about the human body, learning about the human spirit, learning about the human mind, both from a Western and Chinese Asian, Asian uh, philosophy. I also was delving deeply into South Asian philosophies, uh, Hinduism, Vedic work, Buddhism, and most importantly, direct experience of myself, inside of myself. So years passed. I worked with some ayahuasca, some more. Um, not a whole lot of times more, but more. And then uh, at some point, I really started to want to go to Peru. I was having visions of Peru or imaginations of Peru. I wrote a movie about shamanism in Peru, knowing nothing about it, having no experience of it, and very much surprised that when I finally went to Peru that almost everything that I wrote about was pretty accurate, pretty accurate. And uh, so I went to Peru and I started off in Ecuador. In Ecuador, I had my first jungle experiences of the medicine. And it was kind of an extraordinary experience because at one point, one of the people in this little tiny group of Westerners I was in who were tasked with taking this shamanic family down the Rio Napo to the Amazon River and then up to Iquitos on boat uh, for a conference that was happening there. Uh, we were going to drink ayahuasca with this shaman who was a very old, well, not very old, but very ancient lineage, many generations of shamans in his family. Uh, they call them yachaks there, not shamans, of course. But we use the term shaman here because it's easier to say. And, you know, so we did a couple ceremonies with him. And then one of the Westerners said, well, you know, we gringos like the medicine strong. And uh, a little note to your audience, don't ever say that. <laughs> Especially in an so, indigenous country. Oh my yeah, God, yeah, where so, the plant comes from. Oh my. He took it as a challenge oh. and used some hundred-year-old ayahuasca vine he had and really maxed it out. Maxed it out so much that 
when we all drank it, there was not a single person other than myself and his son who weren't hanging over the rails of this patio the whole night throwing up. It was his first time in his life he could not lead a ceremony. Mm. It was so strong. And his son and I were sitting next to each other going, I'm not going to vomit until he vomits. (laughs) I'm not going to vomit until the gringo vomits. You know, we were like, "Mm, total warrior, crazy, holding this intensely strong medicine down. And there's a whole chapter in my upcoming book about this. But the upshot was that during, at the end of this experience, the manifest spirit of what we call Madre Ayahuasca or the jungle spirit or Pachamama or the goddess or, Mm. you know, Kali or, you know, whatever you want to call this intense female energy came to me in a humanish form and said, you're mine now. And I said, yes, <laughs> I accept. And she her. meant what by that? What did you interpret when you heard? Uh, what I interpreted it as was that in my whole existence, I'd been going into the realm of medicine work, of consciousness, of spirit, kind of, you know, maybe not just dipping my toes and maybe get up, getting up to my knees or my hips. And this was like, we're lovers now. Mm. You're mine. I'm this, this intense energy, this pure consciousness of the jungle medicine claimed me. And, uh, you know, I knew at that point that, that this was going to be my life, or at least this life, maybe more than this life. I don't know. And from that point where you were claimed and you surrendered, it sounds like, how much actual drinking have you done? How much uh, also work have you done directly under the tutelage of other shamans? I did, I don't know, I, I can't even tell you how much I've drunk since that time. Uh, at some point I broke a thousand times and I don't know if I've hit 2000 yet. I stopped counting. I stopped caring. I never really cared. I think I counted to a hundred and then I stopped counting. And uh, under shamans, tutelage under shamans, I have had an interesting, different path with that in that I've worked with many different shamans from different cultures of the Amazon. And I never really went to any one of them. Almost did, but never really made it for a sad story, but never really said, you're my teacher and I'm your student. There was one that I worked with probably the most who at some point you know, looked at me and said, you can lead ceremonies now. And I, I don't know how many times that was, many times. And so my, my background is kind of diverse. And adding to that diversity is my background in mystical religions. So in my ceremonies, it's not traditional jungle shamanism. There is traditional jungle shamanism as part of it. But as you know, there's also Sufi poetry and mystical poetry and flutes and jaw harps and, you know, in sacred instruments from many different cultures. We don't think of the jaw harp as being a sacred instrument so much. But in the Tungus, uh, Siberian shamanism, Mongolian and Tuvan, it's a sacred mm-hmm. instrument used by shamans. Yes. Yes, so, yes, I'm aware of all of that. That's amazing. And I love that you referred that I know. So, you know, so for people who are listening, people who are watching, Richard was my first ceremony officiate. Hey. <laughs> and um, oh my gosh, how lucky am I to have gone through that? Because what you provide, and of course, words will never suffice. No one can understand till they experience, period. And you only experience, I believe, when you're called something in you, because it was a great surprise for me. Could we talk about that, that calling? That Because I was one of those people who was a clear, absolutely, who would do something like that? I don't even under, I didn't know anything about it. I just sort of heard about plant medicine and poof pushed it off. And I felt like I woke up one day and everything had changed. And it became like, I must do this. I know I must do this. I feel this, this, I'm so compelled to have this experience. What is that, Richard? What, 
Where does that even come from? And <sighs> why are this some is, people tapped? This is such a huge question. I mean, why do some people, you know, it's been, it's been, it's been called the thirst mm -hmm. in many cultures, you know, the longing that. of the soul, the mystical poets talk about it, Kabir's talked about it, Rumi's talked about it. It's the longing of the heart to know itself and through knowing itself to know the divinity that's within oneself. Mm -hmm. And plant medicines are a particularly interesting and powerful path for at least beginning the journey of that, at least beginning the journey. Um, some, for some people, drinking plant medicine or taking a plant medicine is a one-shot deal or a two-shot deal or 10 times or 20 times. For some people, it becomes their path. Mm -hmm. You know, it becomes a discipline. It becomes an action that maybe not compelled because it's not a compelling experience as you know i mean i i like to joke with people you know like i've i've done this so many times and every time i'm sitting with the cup in my hand this is just green tea puer tea but every time i'm sitting with the cup in my hand i'm shaking a little bit mm. i'm still nervous about it and i imagine on my last ceremony that i do in this lifetime i'll still be a little bit nervous about it I love that you share that. Yeah. I'm so grateful because I've always felt that I get, um, I do get nervous as well before. And yeah, and there's another a wisdom inside of me that says this is nature. It's organic. It comes from the earth. It comes from Pachamama. It is, it's like you're drinking divinity. I understand all of that. How could it possibly yeah. be bad? There's nothing chemical. And yet something in me about stepping over that precipice. Um, and then I'm always grateful I did, but I'm so appreciative to hear you who have had so much experience say that you too go through that. I'm glad you, I'm glad you're appreciative because sometimes that scares the heck out of people. <laughs> No. If he's scared. Um, I'm not really. I wouldn't even call it fear. You know, it's not like earth-shaking fear. It's just the knowledge that I'm going into the mysterious, mm -hmm. and the knowledge also from where I sit behind the altar, behind the mesa, we call it. Mm -hmm. From where I sit, I've got one heck of a responsibility. Oh, let's talk about that, <laughs> because to yeah. me, witnessing you is very awe-inspiring because you're officiating. You drink not as much as we do, I don't think, although correct me, but you do drink. So you're in the same realm, which I love as us. And you do the most exquisite music that creates the most exquisite experience. And as you referred to earlier, at times when we are fortunate enough, you will read poetry. And I have simply never heard anyone read poetry in the way that you do. You bring things to life. You uh, fill the heart. How do you maintain a room, Dr. Roseman, in this state and still perform um, and create this experience for us? I'm going to really terrify you. <laughs> Good. I, have no, I have no idea. Hmm. I have no idea. Interesting. Um, for me, when I when I begin a ceremony, I say a prayer, mm. and the prayer basically it's very similar to Saint Thomas's prayer of "Make me an instrument of Thy peace," but it's kind of like you know, here I am, God, medicine, spirit, whatever. Here I am. Uh, utilize me here. Allow me to be, allow my hands to make your music, allow my voice to sing your songs. And so what I do basically as a ceremony leader is, first off, I, I can't say I've seen it all, but I think I've seen it all, <laughs> you know? I think I've seen everything a person can go through uh, during ceremony. So for me, it's just sitting in a place of internal solidity, like super grounded, but at the same time, very elevated, you know, but on the earth, head in the clouds, 
um, heart right in the middle of it all. And I trust the medicine, I trust the songs, mm -hmm. I trust the music, I trust my assistants, and I trust the people that are in the room as well, which is not always easy, but I do. Because I know that if I'm in a good place, 99.9% .9 chance I'm going to take these people that have trusted me with their consciousness, with their life, really. I'm going to take them from where they are to a very, very, very beautiful, exquisite place that will help them to, in the process of getting there, to heal old wounds, sometimes to heal the cause, the internal cause of illnesses that they may have, um, at times to transform their lives, heal relationships, you know, because all of these things have their roots inside. So I'm trusting this experience. I'm trusting my teachers. I'm trusting the teachers going back to the first person in the jungle. God bless him or her who mixed these two medicines together and drank it and had no tradition and no understanding of what was going on. And from there developed the songs and the music and everything else, thousands of years, we think. So my, one of my teachers says, 15,000 years we've been studying this medicine. We have no idea what its limitations are. Uh, other people will say, well, it's just been a few hundred years. I don't, I don't buy it. I don't buy that idea. There's actually a new book out um, and Rob, my partner, can speak to it uh, because he he researches all of this. And there's a brilliant book out that now has definitive scientific proof how old medicine is because they found it in vessels. They were able to pull out and oh, uh, test it in a lab. And um, I know you'd probably be fascinated by this information. And it, interestingly enough, the academic who took up all this research actually never drank medicine before. So he was he was pretty you know benign about whatever the results were going to be. But he found a lot of things even in beer um, way back in the day. So this is very ancient, without yeah. a doubt. And you know if they found it in archaeological diggings or runes or something like that. Uh, it, that wasn't the first time it was ever on the planet. You know, it's like Chinese medicine. The first Chinese medicine book was written thousands of years ago, and it's so accurate and so advanced and so intense that, of course, the lineage of that existed for quite a long time before that book was even written. So I, I, sometimes I, I feel like the medicine goes back 15, 20,000 years, maybe more. You know, to when the people were first brave enough to live in the jungle environment, in that tremendously vast pharmacy that is the Amazon jungle, and learn the plants. Mm, right. And learn you get another reason plant. why the Amazon is so important. And, yeah. you know, you bring up music, and you told me a story, um, not my first ceremony, but down the road and and fairly recently, I would say in the last five months. And you told me a story. It was so meaningful to me um, because I shared something, you know, really intimate and you were really supporting me, encouraging me. And I want to go there. So you told a story about music and how you didn't have such a great relationship with music as a kid, but here you are now this as in my eyes, very accomplished musician. Can you talk about that and what happened for you as a kid and then what it took for you to reopen to the magic of music? Sure. Um, this also is in the book. <laughs> um, commercial, not out yet though. My initial experience with music was... Um, the limited amount of music that I could hear on an AM radio or that the five or six records that my family owned that I, I could listen to, maybe 10, maybe two or three, actually. I can't think of too many of them. Um, and then I was, I was uh, to learn to be a piano player. Uh, wasn't my instrument of choice, but I studied 
music for several years, I think from about six years old till about eight or nine years old, when the music teacher looked at me and said, you're never going to be a piano player. Oh. And, uh, and I was relieved because I really didn't like it. Of course, like most people, as an adult, I wish I'd stayed with it, you know, <laughs> I wish I'd stayed with it. But, and then uh, as far as singing goes, I used to love to sing. And my fourth or fifth grade music teacher, Mrs. Sims, one of the few people I remember her name, uh, we, were, we were testing out for the choir. And so I sang. She suddenly said, you know, you have the worst voice I've ever heard. Just stand in the back of the room and pretend you're singing. So that was it. I never sang again. That was it. And I loved singing, but that was it. And uh, so years passed, and somebody in high school, I got a jaw harp, you know, Snoopy jaw, jaw harp. It's just not a very good instrument, but I really loved to play it. And I loved to listen to it. And then one, one time shortly after high school, <laughs> this is a funny story, and I had uh, been given some LSD and I was living in a group living situation up in Berkeley and I was 16 and looked like I was a lot older because I had a beard. I like beards, if yes, you have might, might notice. Uh, and I had a beard and so somebody gave me like a little tab of acid, and I took the whole thing, and his eyes like popped open. He said, "That was four. <laughs> and uh, long story, but I ended up at some point in my room, barricading the doors, hiding, you know, trying to understand what reality was. And at some point, I just plucked a hair from my head and stretched it. And just went din, 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 with the hair, and it was such a great sound. It was such a great sound. That's like a hilarious story to me. So that was my beginning of being a musician was playing a hair <laughs> 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 and a jaw harp. Very humble beginnings. Oh, and wow. uh, at some point, I was in a store and there were flutes there, and I picked up a flute and discovered that I could play the flute already. And it went on from there to this crazy collection of different instruments I have. Singing came to me pretty much when the medicine told me I was going to sing. Mm. And uh, so this teacher was full of it. I mean, you can sing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so yeah. sad about silencing you like that. I went through something yeah. when I was um, a kid. I. I started going to summer camp when I was five years old. I know that's incredibly young, but I did. And I was an actress and a singer for most of my life. And I uh, also went to summer stock and I was so young and I went to a very reputable, reputable playhouse out on Long Island. And at the end of the summer, one of the main acting teachers would bring you into the theater and one by one talk to you about your talents and, and what you can make of yourself and give you suggestions where you might go. My goodness, I wanna go out and hug that little girl because she walked into the theater and this man stood be before her and said, you have absolutely no talent. Like oh. there's no reason for you to be pursuing this career. I wouldn't even know what to do with you. I wouldn't even know where to send you. I just remember being so unbelievably crushed. And of course, you know, screw him. I went yeah. out to do it. Yeah. I went to USC. I graduated. I did theater. I did film. I did television and all of that. But, but there's something about that very crushing moment when somebody takes your dream, you know, tries to silence your voice and your, your light. And it's um, very strange and cruel. And, and what's very interesting to me too about that is I noticed in college, 
um, this is hindsight, but in college, there were people I would have said, you know, USC, drama, arts, we had some incredibly talented people. And yet there were people I would have picked out and said, they'll never make it, who were, were co-students of mine. And they became some of the most famous people out there because it wasn't for them so much about the looks or the talent or the whatever. They had a kind of chutzpah about getting themselves out there and really pursuing and uh, representing themselves. And what did I know anyway? So, yeah. uh, well, I, music, music is, music is kind of like a birthright we all have. Mm -hmm. And I believe I have a friend from Australia and he says, he's an Aboriginal and, uh, he says, if you can walk, you can dance. If your heart beats, you have rhythm. If you can talk, you can sing, oh. you know, and it's true. So, I mean, talking itself is a form of singing. You know, and so what is the difference between regular music and an Icaros? This is a really good question. Um, I'm not sure I can answer it. Uh, I'll try. An Icaro, Icaro is a song that's traditionally used in the jungle during ceremonies. They tend to be, there's two different kinds of Icaros, maybe more than two, but... The two main ones are with the shakapa, which is a leaf rattle, mm -hmm. and then the ones that are done by the mainly Shapibo tribe, which use only the voice. And an Ikaro is a song that interfaces the person leading the ceremony's experience and their wisdom with the power or the mariri of the medicine and allows their voice to sing a song that affects changes in the people who are hearing it. For example, here's, here's a tremendous story about this, is I was once quite sick in the jungle. It's a long story how I got quite sick in the jungle, but I was quite sick in the jungle and having a severe cough and, you know, maybe some bronchitis. And in ceremony one night, I was starting to lose the ability to breathe. I was like, <gasps> and you know, I didn't say anything, but the shaman called me up and sang a couple of his songs to me, the Shipibo songs. And I went back to my mat and sat down, took a couple deep breaths and relaxed and thought it was really nice that I was sitting there. And then I went, wait a second, there's no mucus in my lungs. There's no congestion. My throat doesn't hurt. You know, I'm okay. And I was, beforehand, I was thinking, I'm going to have to get to the hospital because I was going into, you know, some distress with it. And that would have been a bad idea because I was at least a two or three hour walk into the jungle and at least a two or three hour taxi ride to the hospital where I was. So I wouldn't have made it. But in the next day, I said, you know, what did you do? How did you do that? And he said, oh, I just sang a song to your lungs. Oh, that's so beautiful. Yeah. And all he was singing was stuff like, you know, if we translated it, it would be with the power of my medicine, I'm cleaning your lungs. I'm cleaning your sadness. I'm cleaning your, you know, just cleaning all of this. Oh, yeah, out. because the lungs in Chinese medicine, that's grief. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. In this case, it was an actual infection. I mean, it was works i'm a, you know i have that acupuncture training so I, I could tell i was pretty sick but i didn't realize how sick i was until the ceremony started so in uh, icaros in a sense this is not something that's planned it's not it's not necessarily written down but it may come through the the shaman or whomever is leading that they can affect a change they can create a blessing uh, move energy shift energy do some healing uh, set an intention or something powerful for the room. That's all Icaros. Yeah, um, I mean there are there are Icaros that a person will learn or experience. Uh, the best ones come from yourself. They're not songs that are, you know, you can go on to Sacred Valley Tribe on the internet and find lots of Icaros that are other people's Icaros. But the best ones come from within you, mm -hmm. and. You know, when I'm when I'm singing a Nikaro, what I notice is that I never sing it the same twice. Mm. 
Yeah. You know, I have my songs. I have my collection of songs that I've come up with over the years or that have come through me over the years. But they always change just a bit according to what, what's happening in the room, according to what's happening to the person I'm singing them to. Mm. And so technically, I don't know what the exact translation of Icaro is or if it even has one. My exact, my translation would be songs that heal. Mm. Songs That's that cool. affect an emotional, mental, or physiological change in the person mm. or room of people that they're being sung to. Uh, my my other analogy of Icaros and medicine songs, which are more song-like, you know, they're prettier, they're usually songs somebody else or you wrote that are written down that are the same each time. But my analogy of Icaros in particular is like the world of ayahuasca, the territory of ayahuasca is vast. There's all three worlds, heaven, earth, hell there. There's aliens, there's astral beings, there's gods and goddesses, there's demons and devils, and all of these astral things exist in this world of ayahuasca. So the analogy would be if you were dropped down in the midst of a city, a huge city, you know, like... Uh, like Lima, for example, huge city. You don't know where you are. First time there. You don't know how to get there. You don't speak the language. Um, assuming you don't speak Spanish, of course, but you don't speak the language. You don't know what the good neighborhoods are, what the bad neighborhoods are. You don't know anything about it. And you don't even know where you have to go to get out of it. You don't know anything. You're just there like, Ugh. And so the Icaro is what comes and takes your hand and guides you through that territory That's and lovely. takes you to where you want to go. And during the course of a ceremony, there'll be many Icaros, many songs, many different forms of music in my ceremonies and poetry. But it's like each one has its experience. Each one has its universe. Each one has its level. So in the beginning, most of my songs are calling in the spirits of the medicines of the different plants. Uh, it's calling in the power of, of ayahuasca, calling in what we call the mariri, the um, healing force, the healing love of the medicine. It has many different meanings, but that's the one that I relate to the most. It's um, stir things up to get rid of stuff that doesn't belong in people. And then as the ceremony goes on, the songs get more and more elevated. You know, it's like we're, we're, we're making our way through this realm of, you know, yucky vomiting and puking and, you know, all of this stuff that people are afraid. And suddenly it's like, well, the songs take us through that into a beautiful place. And that's usually when I start doing the poetry because when I'm in a beautiful place, with the medicine and the room is in a beautiful place and it's just like there's this ah, beautiful stillness in it mm. this beautiful energy this beautiful vibration mm. and then to hear the words of the mystics of the past yes is like you know yeah yeah mm. here's my experience being put into words that somebody else put into words and there's a great deal of understanding with that. And then as the night goes on, the songs kind of like the Icaros get calmer and more into gratitude songs and kind of like, oh, whew, we made it, you know, songs about water and songs about different things that are sweet songs. You know, a sweet song for me, a sweet song in the beginning of the ceremony wouldn't work. Mm. The beginning of the ceremony is really like, we're here, let's do some work. Mm, I love let's that. Let's get rid of the stuff that is blocking us from enjoying life. Mm -hmm. that Good. Is so that that is perfect segue. What about how much to drink? How does somebody know? I mean, clearly we can check in, we've got inner wisdom, ta-da. Yeah. But 
in general, how would you guide somebody to know? Do they take another cup? Do they take a third, fourth cup? Do they stop after one? How do we navigate those brewing waters? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's my job is to choose what each person gets. As far as doing ayahuasca on your own, I don't recommend it. I mean, it's to me, you're, you're. No, but I, I mean, I do mean in the context of working with a shaman or a ceremony yeah. facilitator. Absolutely. That is yeah. where yeah. my heart lies. Certainly okay. I want to be in a safe container. Yeah. I mean, when I'm pouring medicine for people, I go by what I know about them. Like somebody who's been to three or four ceremonies with me is holding the medicine well, doesn't freak out, you know, doesn't ask for help anymore. Then I start giving them more medicine, stronger. And I do leave it open for people to ask for strong. And strong is strong. Strong is strong. A few people ask for extra strong. <laughs> I have to know somebody really well to give them an extra strong dose. Yeah. Most people I start off with a medium, small dose, mainly because I don't want them to get frightened mm -hmm. uh, for their first time. You know, I liken it to a first date. Mm. You know, first date, ideally, That's good. you meet at a restaurant for some coffee and you look in each other's eyes and you talk and you get to know the person you're with. And then the second date and third date, things can get more serious mm. if you want to, if you like them. I find that medicine stays in me operational way longer than most people. Yeah. I've been in situations, you know, we're calling everybody in, you know, it's coming to an end and I'm like, woo, I'm still out there. Uh, that's, yeah. uh, that's really also interesting to navigate as people are having conversations and, and they seem fully present and I'm still having an experience. Yeah. It's physiology. Some people's bodies metabolize faster than others. I'm usually already done by halfway. Mm, wow. And I need a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So. Well, yeah. what about heart feather? Where does that name, where does that moniker come from? And does it heart have. Heart feather to comes from, out? comes from like a lot of my names have come from that I've used over the years mm -hmm. is waking up in the middle of the night and having an, oh, heart feather, of course. And it comes from the Egyptian tradition uh, Egyptian mythology, where I believe it's Osiris, when you die, takes your heart out. It's not Osiris, it's somebody else, I don't remember. Anyway, bad, bad Egyptian historian here. Anyway, puts, puts your heart on a scale, one side of a balancing scale, and a feather on the other. And if your heart weighs more than the feather, you don't get to go into heaven. So the idea that your heart should be so light and so clean and so pure that a feather weighs more than your heart. So that's where the name came from. And let's talk about integration because so many, it seems to me there's a lot of possibilities for ceremony, not always the proper attention on assimilation. Yeah. And yes. I, I think that's incredibly important to certainly been my experience, the post ceremony. What is your knowing about post-ceremony? What are your recommendations to do post-ceremony? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. A good, a strong ceremony is like being born again. Mm. Not in the Christian sense of born again, but like in really being born again. Mm. And so how would you take care of a baby that was just born? You know, a baby that's just born, you don't really want to give them a couple shots or a couple beers or, you know, put a joint in their mouth or give them some red hot peppers or, you know, give them a lot of deep fried food. You want to like very gently nourish them into their new reality. And so that's what I recommend for post ceremony is be gentle Give yourself plenty of time to think, to journal, to eat gentle, clean, what would be called in yogic tradition, sattvic foods, 
foods that are easy to digest, foods that are delicious, foods that are not fried and that are not salty and not hot, no hot peppers and uh, not a lot of oil or anything like that, no pork, no beef. And um, let yourself have some days afterwards to be in nature, if possible, to sit with a potted plant on your patio, if not, <laughs> you know, and, and just, just to give yourself time to settle. There's a new thing now, a fairly new thing called integration circles where people get together and talk about things. And I do provide that online for after ceremony for people. Uh, but, you know, for the first many years, I was involved in medicine work. There was no such thing as integration circles. It was like, you figure it out. And I did. I managed to. And most people that I know, everybody that I know managed to. So, but the integration circles can be really helpful if a person is traumatized by the ceremony or if their stuff has been revealed or stirred up that they don't understand. Uh, I'm a, I'm a, not skeptical of them, but I don't think that it's of value to, for example, pick apart your visions. What did this mean? What did that mean? You know, I saw this and this and this. What does it mean? You know, I don't think there's value in that uh, in general, unless what you saw or experienced was something that came from your real life. For example, if you discover a trauma mm -hmm. that you didn't know was there. I have. Or, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so for those... You could need anything from an integration circle to, you know, you might need some psychotherapy to really work with it or some trauma release work, some, some somatic work mm. to really work with it. I don't, I don't see ayahuasca as the heal all, do all of everything. You know, for example, I, th I think in many cases it's better for giving a direction towards what to do to heal what to do to integrate. You know, I, I used to smoke and I loved clove cigarettes. Oh. And then they became illegal up here. Huh. And I went to Peru and sitting at a restaurant and somebody walks by with a case of cigarettes selling them and there's the clove cigarettes. So I started smoking them again and smoked and smoked and smoked and smoked and smoked and smoked way too many. And I was sitting in ceremony one night and almost as though a station was turned on a television, I found myself lying in a hospital bed with a respirator, intubated, tubes down my nose, the monitor beeping behind me, but the heart monitor, beep, 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 and I died. And then I usually don't recommend listening to voices telling you what to do. But this voice came into my head and said, if you smoke one more of those clove cigarettes, this is your fate. Mm. Wow. And I didn't want to test it <laughs> by smoking another one. I never smoked another one since. Mm. So for me, I didn't need an integration circle to figure that out. I didn't need a therapist to figure that out. That was pretty clear. I trust the medicine because it was good advice. It wasn't like, oh, you know, you should smoke 10 packs more of those every day. It was good advice. I should quit. We all know that. And it was good advice. And one more cigarette. I didn't need to smoke one more cigarette to see if it would kill me. Mm. I didn't need to do that. Yeah, it's a pretty clear message. Pretty clear message. Would one more cigarette have killed me? I doubt it. I do doubt that. But I didn't want to find out. Yeah, absolutely. What grace, right? What grace. Yeah. You know, bravo for really paying attention. Um, yeah. You, Dr. Richard Grossman, are currently involved in a mission 
very interesting about pursuing a gathering home. Um, can you talk about that? What your dream is, what your vision is, what kind of deep needs it can fulfill? What, what is it that you see this being? And what is your greatest desire around it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've kind of like have shifted everything into finishing this book right now. That's my first priority. But, you know, as, as you know, I've had this desire to have a space for the Heart Feather Sanctuary, which is what I'm calling our gathering, our church, our community. You know, I love the word sanctuary, mm -hmm. but the Heart Feather Sanctuary as a place that would be dedicated to doing deep work, dedicated to doing deep medicine and healing work for people. Ideally, a place where people could come and stay for a week or two or three or four and go into deep inner work and deep medicine work. And a place where the community can gather, obviously post-COVID, but a place where the community can gather. And so that's, that's really my vision and dream for it. You see this being in California or is, are you open to location? I'm open to just about any ideas right now or any, you know, I'm paying attention to what, what is available and I'm keeping my eyes open. And at some point it'll be clear to me right now. It's not clear to me. So I'm not acting yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. So a community home base. Um, I, I love that idea. And of course, yeah, I know about these in other countries, um, but not so much here. So yeah, there are, there's not a lot of it happening here. There's a few places, mm -hmm. but you know, I see it as, as really a sanctuary. One of my dreams long-term, you know, initially I wanted to get some property in Baja and turn mm -hmm. it into a community retreat location where people could come and really, you know, not for tons and tons of money, but people who needed to heal could come to heal. I mean, I, I've unfortunately, you know, like anybody else who works with people, there have been people who have come to me for help that have not made it. And, you know, one person uh, a year after their last ceremony, we lost contact, they didn't come back, they committed suicide. And what would have happened if they'd had a place to come to? You know, I can look at many of the musicians and stars and stuff that have overdosed or committed suicide. What would have happened if they had a place where they could really go into their heart and learn their heart and experience the healing beauty that uh, plant medicines have to offer? Mm. I think it can change maybe not change the world in a big sense, but certainly be one of the drops of water going into the ocean of change that can help humanity to heal. And in the meantime, something you do remotely, I find really fascinating is I Ching. Yes. So yeah. casting, right? Isn't that a, a casting of the sticks, so to say? T yeah. Tell me about that. What do people who have a session with you, an I Ching session, who ask a question, what, what's possible there? What do people receive and what, what is allowed yeah. in that realm? Yeah, well, the I Ching is a tool for reestablishing connection to the Tao, to the way, to harmony to inner harmony and to outer harmony. So my feeling is that outer disharmony almost always originates in inner disharmony. You know, if we were clear, you know, really when, when you're incredibly happy, when everything is flowing, when, you know, there's all of the you know, steps on Maslow's pyramid are being fulfilled. You don't think about, what do I need to do? You're doing it. Your life is in harmony and balance. There's abundance. Things are flowing. And then there's times where things get out of harmony. Through no fault, maybe. 
maybe they're just something happened, something went wrong someplace. In China, they call being in that harmonious state having the mandate of heaven. You know, where heaven's grace is upon you. And uh, when the kingdom, when the emperor, because they were a top-down society, when the emperor had the mandate of heaven, there was no famine, there were no floods, there was no war, there was no civil strife, there was no hunger. You know, it was people, people were in harmony and joy. And maybe this never really existed. Maybe it's just mythology. But that's the idea, is that when you have that mandate of heaven, everything is good. When you lose the mandate of heaven, when the ruler is bad, make the connections you would ever like to make here, um, there's famine, there's hunger, there's civil strife, there's climate change. You know, there's all of the things that are going wrong in the world right now because the world is out of harmony. Interesting. Yeah. So it just makes sense to me that this is how it is. You know, and, and because the world is out of harmony, we're trying to fulfill ourselves by using methods that will never satisfy. There's the idea of the hungry ghost in Buddhism, which is a spirit that has infinite desire to eat, infinite hunger, just will consume and consume and consume, but it has a mouth the size of a pea. You know, it can never fulfill itself. It can never be fulfilled. So we don't have mouths the size of peas, fortunately. You know, but, but that hunger that we have, we started talking about it in the beginning. What is that thirst, that desire? You know, if that's not fulfilled, then we look to the wrong medicine to treat our inner disease accumulating excessive wealth, doing things that are bad for us. You know, everything that goes wrong with the human being can be traced back to that inner disharmony. So the I Ching is a tool for speaking to that inner disharmony and giving guidance on how to correct what's going on inside, sometimes outside, to bring a person back into harmony. And like any other tool, it's going to give you advice and information. Well, it's not like any other tool because the I Ching is pretty unique, but it'll give you advice and information. And then it's up to you what you do with it. Mm -hmm. It's not... Uh, Going to an I Ching is not going to a psychic who tells you you're going to meet somebody next week and everything is going to be good and you give them lots of money and next week comes and nothing happens. You know, it's not like that kind of thing. This is giving you a guidance, an internal map of what you need to do to get your life back into alignment. And, you know, surprisingly, sometimes it'll tell people like, what are you worrying about? What are you doing this for? Your life is already great. Just trust what's going on. Trust who you are. Other times it'll be something like, well, what you're doing right now, if you keep on doing this, you're going to end up dead. And they don't mean necessarily physically dead. But if you're going totally in the wrong direction, like how many times uh, do people fall in love with the wrong person and spend years obsessing about it? and even lose their health, you know, even lose their joy mm. for their life. At that point, the I Ching would say something like, you know, what you are doing will not further you. Stop, turn around, go back, find yourself. And there's uh, very it's a very mathematical system. There's 64 different hexagrams, they call it. Each hexagram deals with a very specific aspect of life and in great detail with mythology behind it, with uh, understanding, even with the understanding the characters helps a lot as well. 
And of those 64, there's six variations possible, six different lines or six different possibilities. So it's like it works out to 528 different readings possible using the sticks to cast it. And, you know, a lot's based on the interpretation and how you hear it. But it's, it's a marvelous tool for inner exploration and for bringing your life back into harmony. Mm. And what a great time for people to reach out to you for a session like that, boy, if ever. <laughs> yeah. Hello. I think, Richard, yeah. I once heard you say that ayahuasca is an internal pest purgative. Does that ring a bell? And if oh, yeah. so, what oh, yeah. did you mean by that? I was pretty fascinated. Uh, well, you know, what's known in the jungle is that the ayahuasca vine itself will act as a uh, vermifuge, as something that will expel intestinal parasites. Wow. So in certain, much of the jungle culture, the non-tribal jungle culture, they will drink ayahuasca for the specific purpose of purging and of, you know, getting their intestines cleaned out and consider any visions or any other experience to be just an annoyance they have to put up with. That's hilarious. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. It's a three for yeah. one deal there. Yeah, yeah, but it works. And, you know, if you've ever been to the Amazon, hey, around the cities, people poop into the rivers and, oh. you know, then get a bucket and get water out of the river to drink and people throw their garbage into it and it's full of parasites and bacteria and all manner of things. So they get a lot of intestinal parasites there and this gives them some relief for a while from the parasites. You can use some ayahuasca when you go to India too. Oh yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> that would be a good thing to have in your toolbox. So I, could, I could tell you some India stories. <laughs> <laughs> well, Richard, this is Dare to Dream. What do you next dare to dream? What are your future dreams and goals? Uh, get my book written, published, and hopefully have people's lives deeply affected by the reading of it. Mm. And uh, I have a desire, a couple of desires. I want to go back to uh, parts of Europe where I had communities that I haven't been able to visit for a year and redo or start to do ceremonies in those places again. And uh, I very much want to go to India and spend just some time walking around India, experiencing it, feeling it. I was there when I was 18 and it feels like I've gone through a very long cycle of my life and I want to go back there while I still can thoroughly enjoy it and uh, take lots of pictures. I'm a photographer as well. Oh. So that's another thing. Most people don't know that about me. They don't know that about you. Yeah. Interesting. Not a, not a professional. Where can we see your photography? Is it up anywhere? Uh, eyes of the heart dot zenfolio dot com. Eyes of the heart dot zenfolio dot com. Yeah. Fantastic. Is there anything you'd like to tell people here at the end? Yeah. You know, we've been talking about ayahuasca a lot. There's other plant medicines, of course. There's, you know, mushrooms, which are gaining a lot of recognition as a treatment for depression. Mm. There's San Pedro and peyote, which are very much the energetic opposite of ayahuasca, in that they're masculine and strong and bright, and ayahuasca's kind of jungly and feminine and mysterious. That's why I like her. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of different things. Be very aware and conscious of who you participate in ceremony with, especially with ayahuasca. Uh, there are many people who are not competent to lead ceremonies that are leading ceremonies mainly out of a desire to make easy money. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that to me is a tragedy. You know, we have the example with the so-called QAnon shaman of somebody who has seemingly abused psychedelics. And, um, you know, be very, very careful. Let your heart really guide you as to who you are open to 
and let your intellect and reason and logic really see if this is the right person to trust your soul to because you are and um, better to be cautious and do due diligence before just jumping into a ceremony all ceremonies are not the same all ceremony leaders are not the same all ceremony leaders do not necessarily have the ability to lead a good ceremony and even if they studied with a shaman in the jungle some of them don't have the soul or the heart that it takes so look for what resonates with your heart if something doesn't feel right trust that feeling it's a very important thing that you know i could really go into a lot more but uh don't just you know jump into the first ayahuasca ceremony you hear about yes be careful very much i'm so glad you brought that up um, really important uh, yeah, especially in, right at the beginning about who you choose and yeah. why you choose and that they really are well well schooled and versed uh, ready to properly facilitate yeah. know what they're doing and that you know even that the medicine is really good especially in these times with you know i don't want to see a ceremony turn into a super spreader event and so i have not done any ceremonies since the pandemic started mm -hmm. and uh, there are some people who it's like oh well the ayahuasca will protect us no 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 be logical be sensible ayahuasca is a plant two plants yeah <laughs> richard we, thank you so thank much you. it's been thank such you. an honor and a pleasure to spend this time with you and yeah and thank you for all the places and spaces you were willing to go. Thank you. It feels like we scratched the surface. Yeah. So much more curiosity and maybe there will be more. Uh, have you back this year? That would be awesome. Um, if you would like to find out more about him, absolutely go to heartfeather.com. And as you can hear, he is doing the I Ching sessions and um, I'm so excited about your book. And I end the show with this quote from Christopher Columbus. You can never cross the ocean until you have the courage to lose sight of the shore. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation. You can find us on youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger on Apple Podcasts and every major podcast site. Next week, I have Stephanie James coming to the show. She is a psychotherapist and a published author with over 30 years in mental health. She's a podcast host and host of the Spark Summit, a gathering of today's thought leaders in psychology, spirituality, and science. Remember to tell your friends and family about the Dare to Dream program. Share this show with someone you know will love it and benefit from it. And don't just dare to dream, dare to make all your dreams into your reality. <laughs>